Greatest Hits Radio, I'm Terry Underhill with you, of course, every morning. But this morning's no ordinary day. I'm really pleased to say, join me on the show, it's only Jamie Cullum. Jamie, good morning. How you doing? I'm good. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you too. I love this technology that we can actually be in different places but still see one another, which is, which is terrific. Yeah, it's so cool, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, I love it. Now, the one thing that I am first of all surprised about, because I must have been dreaming, but I am surprised that this is the first Christmas project that you've done with these songs of your own. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting. I think I've maybe you'll be familiar with these feelings about Christmas as well. But I've been thinking about it quite a lot, having you know having written a Christmas album now. I think when you're a kid, if you're lucky enough to have a nice family, you, you tend to love Christmas as a kid, don't you? And then when you're in your twenties, you start to you you don't fall out of love with Christmas. It can feel a bit like a burden, like something you have to do. You have to kind of tick all these boxes. And then when you start your own family, you get a bit older. You start to create your own rituals, and you see it through the eyes of your children it becomes this thing uh, that you feel a lot closer to in a more kind of spiritual and genuine way. And I think if I was to have written this 10 years ago, I don't think it would have had the same depth and I would have thought about it more in a novelty way. And to be honest, I never try and make music that has kind of novelty aspect to it or kind of a throw. I always try to make things that I feel like might last. And so I think it was the right time of my life to make a record like this and indeed to you know, not just do Christmas. I did, obviously, I didn't do any Christmas covers. They're all they're all brand new original songs that hopefully feel timeless and and fairly familiar. Yeah, exactly. And I listened to the album. You know, it was that because it's you're absolutely you've hit the nail right on the head. They sound like the songs you must have heard before. They instantly feel like classics, don't they? Christmas classics. But I think anybody sitting down, you know, you, it's people get number ones at Christmas. They have one of them. You know, David Essex, A Winter's Tale, was one hit wonder and so on for a Christmas song. You've sat down to write 10. I mean, was this just a personal challenge or you couldn't you yeah. couldn't get all your stories in one? It's a bit of a personal challenge. I think I I always think about like so I don't think about Christmas number ones. It's not I'm 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 really I'm not very good at like making a master plan for my career at all. I've always been scratching my own itch and I love people to listen to my music. Of course, I'd love for anything I do to be successful. But I always think about, I think about it in the music nerd terms. So I think about like, I love holding my vinyl copy of Nat King Cole's The Christmas Song album or 10, you know, that's got 10 songs on it. Ray Charles's Christmas album, James Brown's Christmas album, the Sufjan Stevens Christmas EPs. Um, I love these records and I, I pull them out every year from my record shelf and I put them on and it feels like Christmas has started. And I want, I want to make a product like that. I want one that, Obviously, I won't do that with my own record, but for someone else, maybe they'll hear it this year. They'll take it to their hearts. It will help bring Christmas into their house like various things in my life do. And they'll pull it down off the shelf beginning of December. They'll put it on their turntable. They'll put it in their CD player. They'll put it on their their streaming service and it'll feel like Christmas is being brought into their house. And I love the idea of being part of that ritual, but also writing Christmas music these songs that we love they're written by some of the greatest songwriters of all time they're not throwaway you know rudolph the red-nosed reindeer santa claus is coming to town white christmas this is irving berlin hoagie carmichael harry warren you know these are the the great songwriters and you know bob dylan has covered these songs so it, to try and add to that list of 40 or 50 or so songs that we pull out every year was a bit of a songwriter challenge to me as well. I think the interesting thing as well is that these songs sometimes, some of those big songs that you mentioned, at the time they came out, they were new novelty songs. Nobody knew that years later that people would still be hearing them. I mean, I interviewed Shakin Stevens this week and he was telling me that 38 years ago when he recorded that song, he thought it would be a throwaway Christmas song and 38 years later he's still talking about it. And I guess listening to this album, it's going to be the same. People are going to want to come back to this all the time well maybe you never know I, I i couldn't say that for sure all i know is that i put a great deal of care and attention into it i certainly uh, uh with well, no offense to shaken stevens at all i i certainly wouldn't say that I, I they they felt kind of throwaway i tried to write them in the sense as how i'd write anything um with a sense of kind of permanence and and put a lot of kind of care and attention to and into the melody and the lyrics and the the, the way the songs are structured and the arrangements and where it was recorded how it was recorded i'm i'm a bit of an obsessive about this kind of details so you know i built it i built it to last um 
you know, I, I don't know for how, for how many people it will last for, but uh, hopefully the people that fall in love with it, it will feel, it will reveal, you know, it reveal itself to them every year. Yeah, and I think in fairness, he, he was he was recording and performing somebody else's work. You, you know, the, yeah. the writer may have felt the way you felt, that it was a, a classic f- forever. Um, I think, I suppose in a sense as well, how do you go about writing a Christmas song versus all the other stuff that you've written? I mean, how does how do you think of it differently apart from that raw emotion of Christmas? I think um, it's limited, it's... It's rare that you write a song where you have any limitations unless you kind of self-impose them. Um, you know, when you sit down to write a song for any album, it's like it literally could be about anything. It could be about your toaster or your teacup or or a relationship or, a you know, <laughs> or a rubber duck. It could be about anything. You know, when you're writing a song about Christmas, there is a a narrative there that you can dig into and, and go into with with some any depth you like so there is that or limitation but then apart from that i feel like i kept coming back to joni mitchell's song river because it's a christmas song but it's also not a christmas song and you can listen to it any time of year and whilst i imagine people will listen to this album at christmas time i i, I did try and think of them as songs that would just feel like great songs under any microscope when you put 10 songs together, can you, are they like children you can't choose your favourite or is there a song that absolutely, if you could only take one of them on a desert island, that's the one you take? Yeah, I think I think I, I am really close to them all. And, you know, it's only 10 songs. That, as you say, there's, there's, there's kind of no fat on it and I, I purposefully made it 10 songs long. You know, 11 felt like too much. Um, but there's one song in there called How Do You Fly, which... Uh, you know, it's slow, it's long, um, it's not the most instantaneous one, but I feel in terms of of, of depth and what it's trying to say, it has it's it's probably the one I'm closest to. It's it's about the feeling of wonder you get uh, around Christmas when you're a child versus the um the idea of losing a sense of that magic as you become an adult, that border from childhood into adulthood where you realise that a lot of the stories you've heard aren't necessarily truthful and the world is a lot more of a scary place than you were led to believe. And, you know, kind of jumping into that world of adult, adulthood and kind of learning how to fly, basically. Um, and, um, you know, I feel as though that, uh, that that song feels particularly special to me. I, I, I love what it communicates and... Um, the orchestration on it sounds particularly beautiful. So that's probably my favourite if I had to pick one. Well, I'm glad you've chosen it because I'm going to play that song in a little while on the show. But I also wanted, I mean, you alluded to the fact that the craftsmanship, the work that went behind this, I mean, recorded in the legendary Abbey, Abbey Road Studio 2, you've got some of the best uh, writers, pro- uh, not writers, sorry, you've got the best producers, you've got the best uh, studio technicians, and the result just, you yeah, know, was just fantastic. Thank you so much. I mean, it is a real pleasure to be able to reach out to those people to get them to work on a project like this because um, it just means that every aspect of it has um, has real uh, expertise behind it, you know, that goes beyond what I can do. And it's always great when you pass your music on to the next link in the chain and they lift it up even higher. And, you know, to, to me, recording an Abbey Road with those engineers and having it mixed by Greg Wells in Los Angeles, they're like, it's like me giving Christmas presents to myself. <laughs> Well, on that subject, how what does the Jamie Cullum and family Christmas look like? What are you going to be doing? How are you spending the big oh, day? I'm not even <laughs> sure yet. I think that's the whole point. We've actually, uh, I've tried to make no plans this year, actually, because, you know, if 2020 has taught us anything, then don't make any plans. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think whilst it's not a very good answer to your question, there are currently no plans. And, and you're right, though, it is. It's been the, it's been a crazy year for everybody. I mean, I look excitedly that you've got dates in in April next year or f- throughout next year, actually. And it's interesting that you're yep. coming here to South Wales, uh, which is fabulous. You're going to be at the Cardiff Arena thing on the 17th. I bet you are just chomping at the bit to get back on stage. You know, I, I, I am, but I'm, 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 I'm really thinking about seeing live music myself. Like, I think the thing I miss is, is, is going to see... Uh, a concert or a theatre production or an exhibition or something and, and enjoying a, a collective experience like that with other people is something I really miss. So I, I do miss it as a performer, of course. It's a big part of my life. But um, I think, you know, going to see stuff will, will, will feel wonderful too. And and will you be approaching those shows, in the ones that you perform, will you approach them differently or is it is it sort of the whole of, of 2020 just put on hold and, and, and moved forward a year? Cool. 
I guess uh, what can people look I, yeah, forward I don't, to? I don't honestly know the answer. I mean, I think there's no question it will feel it will be different. It wouldn't be what I would have presented in 2020. I mean, I'm 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 terrible at repeating shows anyway, as much as I'm asked to. Mm. <laughs> I can never do the same thing. Um, it's a bit of a disease. Uh, so yeah, it'll it'll definitely be it'll be what it will be at the time. I I couldn't even guess right now, but I think you know we've all been changed by this year in different ways, and I'm sure that'll be reflected in how the concerts are. And and for you, everyone, and you get sick of hearing this, I'm sure, but you know you're like uh, we had the pizza pan of a pizza pan of pop. You're the pizza pan of jazz pop because you just never grow old. I mean, looking at you, you you still look like a 20 year old. I mean, it's well, crazy. I, What's going on? Lens, the camera lens is being very <laughs> it's being very kind. I can assure you, there's. Plenty of grey hair here and uh, um, uh, plenty of encroaching bags under my eyes, but you're being very kind. Thank you very much. I mean, I de- in my defence, I looked 12 till I was about 29, <laughs> which is not fun for anyone. I can assure you it's not. It, if it's paying dividends now, fine. But I tell you what, for most of my l- life, it was a bit of a burden. Burden, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> you couldn't couldn't get into any pubs, and you. Yeah, imagine exactly, having said that, you yeah, I was still getting um, half fare on the bus till I was about twenty two. But we've got something in common, and when we talked about the fact that we 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 worked together previously at the show, and uh, I'm actually just about an inch taller than you, so I <laughs> I was like, there you oh, go. It, it's got its benefits. Brothers from, brothers from another mother. <laughs> I wish I had the musical talent though, uh, Jamie. It's fabulous talking to you. It's great to see you again after a, a few years. But uh, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I am going to play that. Thanks great Christmas song and wish you and your family and everybody a very happy Christmas and thank you. To you as well, Terry. Thanks very much. Look after yourself. You too. Thank you, Jamie.